Boa tarde a todos. É um prazer ter todos vocês aqui mais uma vez, no, dando sequência ao nosso seminário Lógicos em Quarentenas, que é uma parceria da Sociedade Brasileira de Lógica com o Grupo de Interesse em Lógica da Sociedade Brasileira de Computação. E hoje nós vamos ter a palestra do professor Raniel Barbosa, da UFMG, Extending Enumerative Function Synthesis via SMT-Driven Classification. Raniel, muito obrigado por participar do nosso seminário. E lembrando obrigado a todos você, que Bruno. essa apresentação está sendo gravada e a gente vai ter, no final, um tempo para interação. Então, vamos mudar para o inglês na nossa ideia de manter a tradição de tentar aumentar a reach of these talks. Então, obrigado pela introdução, Bruno. Uh, I'm going to present a joint work with Andrew Reynolds, Daniel Oraz, and Cesare Tinelli. This work was done while I was a postdoc at the University of Iowa. Uh, now I have moved to FMG. So in, in this talk, I'm going to cover the idea of how we try to improve function synthesis, program synthesis via our work in SMT solving. So first, let's talk about what is program synthesis. Program synthesis is um, characterized as the holy grail of computer science in the sense that it's an idea that it, it's very appealing. It's the idea that you can give a synthesizer, this magic box, a specification of something that you want to be done, and then it will provide to you a way of having this done, a program. So something that is capable of executing uh, a given behavior and then producing what you wanted before. So to give you an example, say that you would like to have a program, a function that receives as inputs uh, what you have here as the, the left column of this table and then produces these as outputs. And what is, for example, a program that gets this one input and produces an output? An example is a program that works like this in which ITE is anything else, right? So if you are in the first case, in the first two cases here, then you just sum the input by one. Otherwise, if you are in the third case, you multiply it by two. If you are in the third case, you multiply by two and add two, which is kind of a not very satisfactory solution because you can think of other solutions to this problem. For example, this also is modeled by this function, the function that just gives the, the uh, exponentiation of two given the different exponents here. But there are yet another kind of programs that you can think that satisfy this specification. Say that you have a different way of giving specification, something that has an input state with a given valuation to variables, and then an output state with a different valuation to these variables. So for example, here we start with zero and one for the values of a variable, and you finish with one and zero and so on, as the table shows. So what is a program that satisfies this specification? Uh, you have, for example, the program that it always increases in one, the first input, and decreases in one, the second output. This program is correct in all of these cases. This, however, again, it's not very satisfactory because you can think that this is probably modeling the swap function the program that given two inputs will reverse the values of these inputs. But again, you could synthesize other kinds of programs. So the thing with program synthesis is that it's hard to say what you want. And then once that is done, it's kind of hard to find what is that you want. So the two main challenges is first capturing, well, second, well, there are two main challenges, let's not order them, is what I'm showing here is to capture the intention of what you want to be synthesized. And then once you have that put down, it's to explore the search space between the possible programs that solve your solution. Then you have to write a specification well. And then if you want for this synthesizer to be feasible in any way, you have to be able to constrain the search space effectively as well as navigate the search space. So in this talk, we're going to explore how to address this uh, these challenges more efficiently than what is done in the state of the art. So, and you, you may ask yourself, like uh, I have said that this, this sounds really cool, but uh, is it feasible? There are applications of this and the answer is yes. 
there are many applications, both in formal methods or in programming languages, formal verification and so on, in which people use program synthesis effectively in real world applications. For example, you can use for super optimizations, which is to have compilers automatically generate optimizations. You can have program repair, which is the idea that you have a program that for some reason is wrong, say it does not compile, and then how do you automatically fix that program? Programming by examples, as some of you may know, this is, for, for instance, a feature of Excel, Microsoft Excel, in which you can provide to it a series of examples of input-output pairs. It can automatically generate to you a function that is correct on those input and output examples, which is similar to the first example I gave to you. <coughs> Sorry. Circuit synthesis, which is the idea of automatically generate a circuit that satisfies a given property, loop invariant. So if you want to prove that the loop uh, has a certain invariant and then the program is correct, you can do these things using program synthesis. Okay, so coming back to the idea that you have a synthesizer and then you want to correctly write a specification, constrain the search space, and then be able to explore the search space effectively, it has been proposed a standard for this problem. So formulating this problem in a very specific way such that it allows you to better, uh, uh, to better accomplish a solution for those challenges that I said before. For example, a specification, if you want to precisely write a specification, there is no more precise way than using logic to do it. And then in syntax guided synthesis in this standard, you specify what your program should do, what is the program that should be done by the synthesizer via a second order formula. And it's a T formula in the sense that it's a formula in second order logic modulo a theory. And this theory, it's understood in the sense of satisfiability modulo theories theories. Uh, so for example, uh, an example of a theory is the theory of arithmetic of linear integer arithmetic, in which you have uh, some symbols like plus, uh, minus, multiplications between constants, things like that. Right, and then, uh, so in this formula here, you have a specification such that there is a function, this function is going to be your program, and the specification is that this program, given a valuation to it, you are going to satisfy a formula for all possible inputs of that program. So this is a precise way of capture any specification that you may think of. And then in order to constrain the search space for the function that you want to synthesize here in your specification, you would use a context-free grammar. So this context-free grammar will give to you a language in which you can have possible programs that are going to be a solution to the specification that you wrote. So this, this has been proposed some years ago by a number of people working in program synthesis. And then many techniques have been developed to try to solve this problem effectively once you have this formulation. So the, the most successful one is in the sense that it's, it's the most implemented, used most commonly, not so hard to do, not very specific, more general, is enumerative counterexample guided inductive synthesis. So to give you an example of how this works, say that you have here this specification. So this specification is, uh, I'm omitting the quantifiers here, so assume that F is existentially quantified and X is universally quantified. And then you have to provide for, to satisfy this specification, a function, a program F, that given these inputs, it has this behavior here. It satisfies these outputs. And in order to produce a value for F, a possible program, you are allowed to use this language here. So strings produced by this grammar. And then the way that you would solve this using this paradigm, enumerative counterexample guided inductive synthesis, CGs, is to have two components in the way in which you try to solve the problem. One component is enumerating possible solutions, which means that it's enumerating possible values for F according to the context-free grammar that you have in your specification. And then you have another component that is checking if the candidate solution that you produced works in the specification. 
And if it does not, it produces a counterexample that will help you to enumerate a different solution. So take, for example, this case here, in which you produce a candidate for F as X. You can produce this candidate because it is uh, a member of the language defined by this grammar. So uh, if you enumerate this candidate for F, X, you have now to test whether F of any input X and Y is X, does that satisfy this specification? And the answer is no. And a way of proving that, uh, well, not proving, of guaranteeing that um, this candidate is not a solution is to produce a counterexample. Because if you have this counterexample, for instance, in which the first input is one, the second is zero, then this value for the function does not work. You can see here that this will not satisfy the first constraint. The first constraint says that the value of the, of the first input that you give has to be the input plus one. And this is not the case if the function models to f. Then the way that this paradigm works is that once you get a counterexample, you instantiate the specification with that counterexample, and that provides to you witnesses of previous failures. This is a witness of the failure of the candidate X, and then this will guide you so that you don't enumerate that solution again, that candidate solution again. So you add this to the set of counterexamples, and then if you continue to do this successively, you will try other candidates, they will fail, you will increase the number of counterexamples that you have until you produce such a candidate that is more complex. Because note here that I was first enumerating things of size uh, zero, if you are counting operators that are non uh, nullary, like x, y, zero, one, these have size zero, x plus y will have size one because it has the operator plus. And all this will fail until you have to generate a more complex expression that has, for example, the IT construct, the if then else, this will, this will fail and then you'll continue to refine until you can generate such a candidate. So this is the idea, is that you enumerate increasingly more complex candidates and then if they fail, you learn examples of their failure that will prevent you from generating that same candidate again. That's the idea of enumerative counterexample guided synthesis. And even though you may think that this is a stupid way of solving this problem, you can, you can have smart ways of making stupid work. For example, to effectively prune the search space based on examples and so on, there are a number of techniques to do this. And while this is great, it still has a big issue that even though you can try to more effectively navigate the search space, it's still hard to scale. Because as long as you, as, I mean, you, you will be running this program enumerating different candidates. And then when you have to go to more complex candidates, it can take a long time. So if you take, for example, this is the, the language that is used for Saiga solvers. It's an extension of SMT lib, which is the standard language used by SMT solvers. And here, this is a, a grammar describing how you would write operators in a bit vector uh, language, in, in which here you have operators, operations on bit vectors, right? So you have some binary operations, some unary operations, some constants, and so on. And if you take these are numbers produced by CVC4's enumeration, and when it implements enumerative CGs, just doing enumeration, and you can see that this grows exponentially as expected. So as while other, <laughs> similar to other things that grow exponentially, that we're more familiar with these days, right? But let's not go there. Uh, so here you can see that as you increase the size of the terms that you are enumerating, this quickly gets out of hand. So if you have to find a program that solves your specification that has uh, a size five, for example, in this grammar, for example, it would probably not be feasible for you to, to wait until that candidate is generated. So there, are, there have been some approaches to try to minimize this issue, which is applying divide and conquer algorithms. So now the idea is that you are not directly enumerating a candidate solution to your problem. You are enumerating pieces 
of a solution that you are going to combine and then have an overall candidate solution. So for example, uh, say that you have these points here. You have to produce a candidate that works in all of these points. So it has to be a candidate for F that if you have this input, you have this output and so on, right? So a possible way of trying to do this is to find uh, candidate solutions that work in some of the points and then combine them into a candidate that works in all the points. And the way to do this, a way of doing this, is that you are enumerating two things separately. One is terms. So these terms are going to be terms of the same type of the, of the function that you have to synthesize. So in that example that you have, you have to have an integer function. So we are going to be enumerating these terms. And then you are also enumerating, uh, par in parallel, predicates that are going to, to be Boolean formulas over the inputs that you have in your problem. And then you're going to use decision tree learning to combine these things. So if you, if you want to, to have an example, then say that we enumerated this predicate and the idea of using decision tree learning is that you are building a tree in which you are going to, based on the, the attributes that you have in this tree, which are going to be these predicates, you are going to be putting points into different leaves of the tree. So if you have this predicate here that is comparing your second input with your first input, opa, sorry. In the case that the second input is smaller or equal than the first, you are going to put the points in this leaf, otherwise in this other leaf. Now, the idea is that if you can find a candidate solution that works in these points and another candidate solution that works in these points, then you can combine both of them into an overall candidate solution that works in all the points that you have currently in your counterexamples. And what you're going to do is to take the terms that you have enumerated and see if they can correctly satisfy the assignments, the, the, sorry, the counterexamples that you have here before in each of the leaves. So zero does not work because it breaks the qualities that you have to satisfy here, right? The same for one, X and Y. However, X plus one works. Which means that if you assign the function F to X plus one, it works in both these points. It does not work, however, in this case here. So you have to try a different, so because you, you are going to try again all the, all the different terms, but what is interesting to see is that we have different assignments for the function F that works in different sets of points. But we can combine them using this tree representation with an, with an if then else expression. And what this allows to you is a much better scalability because here you are building a solution of size three, I'm counting the ITE, the lesser than equal and the plus operators here by enumerating only terms of size up to one. So you can greatly reduce the exponential behavior of your algorithm by being able to build overall solutions that are bigger from smaller solutions. So this is very good. However, it has an issue. It only works if you have what it's called pointwise specifications, which are specifications in which each point, each one of the counterexamples, each one of the input points for the function is independent of the other. So Give, say that we have this example here in which, so I'm increasing the specification that I had before with this other constraint here for the specification. One thing that was interesting in, in that algorithm that I just showed before is that I was looking for a solution for a given set of points completely independent. I only had to check if that solution was enough to satisfy the points that I had in that leaf. If I have, however, this other constraint here, I have a relationship between this application of the function and this other application of the function, which means that say that I generated uh, this counterexample, which will give me this set of constraints here, I cannot assign a value for the function f at this point without considering the value of the function f in this other point, which means that I cannot apply decision tree learning as it's generally applied in which I am classifying a given set of points. I am labeling a given set of points in terminology that is used in this field 
independently of how I'm labeling sets of points in a different leaf of the decision tree. And this absolutely breaks the algorithm as had, it has been implemented in previous approaches. Okay, so, and this is an issue because there are many important applications that we could be using program synthesis, that we use program synthesis for, uh, in which we would like to have the scalability that we have with divide and conquer techniques. For example, <coughs> sorry, for example, if we are doing variant synthesis in which the specification have constraints in this shape, in which if the invariant holds in a given point and then I apply the transition relation, X prime is the subsequent point to X, according to the transition relation, then the invariant should also hold in that next point. I have a relationship between the invariant, which is what I am to synthesize in the point X and the point X prime, which means that I cannot assign a value to a given point of I without considering the next point of I. So any kind of specification that has this kind of shape in which different, because if you find a counterexample for X, for example, this will give you different points, right? And then it will prevent you from independently assigning values to points. So this is the, our idea then in this work is to try to extend divide and conquer so that it can be used for arbitrary specifications. We are no longer restricted to pointwise specification. So we can apply it, for example, for invariant synthesis. And then there are two, two main components for doing this. One is finding a term assignment, so uh, values for functions in given points so that they are consistent with dependencies between points. And this we do using pure SMT solving. I'm going to talk more about this soon. And also extend decision tree learning so that we can take into account um, these dependencies between points as well. So by, and, and we also use uh, SMT solving to do this, but we, we have two different ways, either using SMT solving directly to the decision tree learning or combining SMT solving for uh, resolving the dependencies between points with classical decision tree learning. I'm also gonna mention this. Before I, I, talk, I talk about this though, I want to talk a little bit more about SMT solving and how we, um, we use SMT solving in general to, to solve uh, synthesis problems. And then I can dive in a little deeper into what we actually, how do we actually use it to extend, divide and conquer. Okay. So, Satisfiability model theory. So when I say SMT solving, it's solving the satisfiability model theories problem. So the satisfiability model theories problem, so one way to formulate it is that you have, uh, say that you have first order formulas and we can, without loss of generality, assume that these formulas are in um, CNF, which is clausal normal form. You can always transform any formula into CNF in a satisfiable transformation. And given that you have a formula, in first order logic, and you have a set of background theories such as arithmetic that I mentioned before, or with equality, so on. You need to find a model for this formula that, well, you need to find an interpretation that models the formula according to these theories, to a combination of these theories. So you have to find an interpretation that makes the formula true while respecting the semantics of each one of the theories that you have. So to give you an example, say that I have two theories, the theory that has the equality reasoning, the theory that has the arithmetic reasoning, and I want to determine if I can satisfy a formula phi that has this set of constraints here. Note that this formula is in CNF, I have two clauses here, well, three clauses, sorry. And I have to simultaneously satisfy these three clauses, right? So a way to proceed this is, this is how SMT solvers generally do, is to reason first about the Boolean structure of the formula and then about the theory components of the formula. So by looking at these constraints, what I can see is that here, so I'm, I'm separating the literals, the components of the, of the constraints in terms of the theory that they talk about. So this is linear integer arithmetic, and this is 
in the theory of equality and uninterpreted functions. And an uninterpreted function is a function to which the semantics is not previously defined by a theory, like plus, for example, which is interpreted. So I can deduce, based on arithmetic reasoning, that x is zero in this formula. That, sorry, that this formula entails that x1 is zero, which is a consequence of these two literals here, right? Since x is an integer. Uh, and then with this constraint using equality reasoning, if x1 is equal to zero, then by congruence, f of x1 must be equal to f of zero. Uh, this is conflicting with this literal here. So since this is a clause, I have to satisfy the, this clause. Since this literal cannot be satisfied, I have to satisfy the other literal if I want to simultaneously satisfy all the clauses in the problem. However, by arithmetic reasoning, if x1 is equal to zero, then x3 plus x1 cannot be greater than x3 plus one, which is what would be necessary to satisfy this literal. Therefore, this formula is unsatisfiable because Given these two clauses here, which always have to be satisfied because this is a conjunction, I cannot satisfy neither of the literals in this other clause. So this is the, the kind of reasoning that is done by, if you want to solve a satisfiability model theories problem. I cannot find a model to this formula. This formula is unsatisfiable because of arithmetic inequality reasoning, as well as Boolean reasoning. So, <clears throat> SMT solving then it I mean it's it has been it has been studied by a lot in the last 20 years. There are many things that have been done. Uh, you are in general reasoning about different sets of theories. The decidability of the overall problem will depend on the decidability of the theories and the combination of these theories that you are using. There are different decision procedures that are applied for the different theories you are generally splitting how you solve this problem in two parts. You reason with SAT solvers, which are uh, systems for solving the satisfiability problem, the proposition satisfiability problem. And you get then a conjunction of literals as a model for your Boolean abstraction of the formula. And of in, on this, you apply these decision procedures because the decision procedures are generally meant to work on conjunctions of literals. And depending on the theory, you have different ways in which you're going to reason about that specific theory. And you can also define your own theories by using axioms and uninterpreted functions, which, which is to say that SMT is incredibly expressive since it is first order logic and SMT solving provides an effective way of solving problems in which you can encode basically anything. So the main architecture that is implemented by SMT solvers is, is this, in which you have uh, three main components. One is a rewriter, a preprocessor that given a formula simplifies it. So it, for example, eliminates such terms that are not going to be interesting for your search, like X plus zero, you know that it's always equal to X, so you can already do this reduction. And you have an interplay between different components. So the interplay I was talking about before is one in which you have a SAT solver and a theory reasoner, in which the SAT solver is going to provide to you candidate interpretations for the propositional abstraction of the formula. And the theory reasoning can say to you that by arithmetic or by equality, for example, that is conflicting. So you need to find a different proposition assignment. And you, if you have axioms in your problem that are defining other operators, then you would have an instantiation module that is going to be taking, uh, that's going to be reasoning about those terms. And then in the end of the day, you can either produce a model for your formula or prove that the formula is unsatisfiable. Note, however, that uh, if you, if you are solving a problem with quantifiers, for example, when you are in in general, uh, not in general, I, I forgot the word I was going to say. But if you are in regular first order logic, then this is going to be semi decidable. So it will terminate if the problem is, uns is unsatisfiable, but there are no guarantees that you can find a model for it. However, when you are in the quantifier free case, it's generally decidable. So you are guaranteed to reach one of these two outcomes. It may not be the case that it is in feasible time, but 
eventually would reach it. Okay. So now, how do we leverage this to solve a syntax-guided synthesis problem, right, with an SMT solver? Uh, so recent, th this has been done kind of recently in works mainly by Andrew Reynolds, which is a co-author in this paper. We also have a, another work in which we extend uh, the ground SMT solver to deal with this. But think of it like, let's consider the problem that we had before, in which we had this specification and this context-free grammar to specify the, the possible ways in which I can try to build a solution for the specification of my synthesis problem. And then if I want to solve this problem directly in the SMT solver, what I could do is that I could encode this problem into a data types problem in which now I have this grammar here. So it's a deep embedding into data types of the language of my function. So I have this data type and these are the constructors of the data type. I have two data types, data type types, uh, one for the, and they, they, there's a correspondence, right? So B corresponds to the, the B production rule here that was modeling booleans and A corresponds to the A production rule here that was modeling integers, integer functions. And now I have the specification in terms of an evaluation function in which D is going to be a value of the data type, the data type A. And I have to evaluate D in the inputs, which is mapping here the specification. So for example, if I generated a term using this data type, for example, plus XX, this term by the evaluation function is interpreted as you would expect it in the for the integer type, which is summing the variables x and x, with the summing here being the regular arithmetic, op arithmetic operation. So this simply encodes as data types, the original problem, the grammar, and then this evaluation function makes the correspondence between the data types embedding and the original type of the function that you had. So if I wanted to find a solution for this problem, I would ask my data type solver to generate a value that satisfies these constraints. And such a value is the one that we had seen before, right? This f expression, just that it is phrased in terms of the data type values. And the SMT solvers, they have a data types decision procedure that given a set of constraints, it is capable of finding uh, data type values that satisfies these constraints. So it's a satisfiability problem, but phrased in terms of data types. And this directly provides you a way of solving the problem. So the, to make a correspondence of what we had seen before of how the CG's paradigm would work, my solution enumerator would correspond to the quantifier free SMT solver with the data type solver uh, generating terms that satisfy the constraints in terms of that deep embedding. And then the candidate here would be a model for the data types constraints, a value for that D variable, for example. And the instantiation module would be checking if the candidate solution that you proposed works in the specification, because note that the specification here is universally quantified, right? So I have to check whether this value works on all possible values of my inputs. Uh, checking this can be done efficiently because this basically amounts to a ground satisfiability query, which is generally decidable. And in case that this candidate does not work, you produce an instantiation of that specification, which is again just a counterexample. So there is a direct correspondence between these two things. So it becomes natural to phrase this problem in terms of a problem that an SMT solver can directly deal with. <coughs> All right. Okay, so now that I, so I wanted to give more details about how, how the cyber solving is done in terms of SMT. Now we can go to the actual contribution of what I'm talking about here, which is this UNIF PI algorithm, <coughs> which is a general divide and conquer framework. So as opposed to a divide and conquer solution that only works in pointwise specifications, which means that so UNIF stands for unification, which is the idea that you unify these partial solutions and PI is pointwise independent. 
So you can use unification techniques that are what is necessary for doing divide and conquer if the specification is pointwise or not. It's independent of the specification being pointwise or not. All right, so <clears throat> as I said, so as, so coming back, the, the, the challenges here as is DC can only be applied to pointwise specifications. And to solve this problem, we are going to extend it by having SMT solving, resolving the point dependencies and extending decision tree learning so that it can take this resolving into account. So this is the, the main picture of the, of the new method, UNIFPI. And the idea is that uh, this component here corresponds to the solution enumerator, but you are checking two things because you have two different kinds of constraints. One, so this note that these are the lemmas here that correspond to counterexamples. These are the counterexamples I had before, but I'm assuming that I have a specification in which there is a dependency between some points. Uh, so I have something called an SMT-based classifier, which is an SMT solver that is generating assignments for my points. So for in, by a point here, I mean the application of the function in a given input list, right? So in the example, in the running example, I have these four points and what I need to do to satisfy these constraints is to find an assignment for each one of these points so that the whole constraint works. And the way that the, the whole procedure is applied to is that I'm generating two things. I'm generating an assignment for the points in a way that I, sat that I satisfy these constraints. And simultaneously, I'm also generating an order predicate list. And this order predicate list defines a decision tree. You can think of it as the attributes in the tree. So P1 would be the first attribute in the tree, P2 would be the second attribute in the tree, and so on. And I'm going to, to give an example in a little bit that shows how this explicitly represents a decision tree. But the thing is, you have this assignment for your points, and you have the predicates for building this decision tree. And the question is, can you correctly classify your sample? The sample in this case is the set of points and the constraints, the dependencies between the points. Can you correctly classify them with the term assignment that you produce and the set of attributes that you have? And if you cannot do it, then you are going to be generating the separation lemmas. Separation lemmas encode the reason why the classification failed. So there are now two kinds of lemmas that are taken into account by your SMT-based classifier. One are the refinement lemmas that constrain the, the candidate solutions. So I had a solution that failed the specification because it was not satisfying some of these constraints here. So I have to produce another candidate to satisfy all of them. But since I'm doing this construction in terms of a decision tree, if the decision tree itself fails, so if I failed in the current set of examples, I need to know why it failed, which is a matter of how I assign my terms. They may be consistent with the refinement lemmas, but they are not consistent with how I try to build the tree. Okay. Uh, and what this, that's what I was saying. Oh yeah, sorry. And then and then you can you can generate a correct classifier, but then it can still fail the specification. So there are, and then you're going to generate refinement lemmas, which are the counterexamples, as we had in CGs before. So there are two levels of things that have to be checked, and for each one of these levels, there is a set of lemmas that are generated that have to be satisfied by your ground SMT-based classifier here when it's trying to produce candidate solutions. And the nice guarantees about this framework is that you have uh, bounded solution completeness, which is the same kind of result that you have for counterexample guided inductive synthesis for CGs, is that if there is a solution within a given bound of the search space, it's going to be found. And another thing is that it's guaranteed to find minimal solutions, which is generally something that we're interested at. Because if you remember the first examples I gave in, in the talk, there are, <clears throat> For example, that input-output pair in which you could either have a solution of two to X or a big ITE, generally smaller solutions are more general. It's an Occam's razor thing. 
So this is something that are, we are interested at. And when you are producing a candidate solution, you can bound generally just the size, but now we have other moving parts here, right? We not only have the size of terms, but we have the size of predicates. We have how many predicates we're going to use in the order predicate lists and how many different terms are going to be using to assign terms to the points. So the overall fairness criteria that we use to determine how we're going to explore this search space that has all these directions in which you could be exploring it is based on these two main criteria. <clears throat> so number of terms is how many different terms you're going to be using your term assignment. Number of pred is how many predicates are going to have in your ordered predicate lists. This is equal to the number of terms minus one because the idea is that you are going to need at most, uh, if you have two different terms, for example, one predicate is, is sufficient to, to separate them. And the size grows logarithmically in the number of terms. So you can have uh, more terms while increasing the size less because remember increasing the size leads to big scalability issues. Okay, so now to provide a full example of the technique itself, consider again the, the specification that we had seen before. And if you want to, to find a solution for this, for this synthesis problem, consider we are using that same grammar in which we had integer and boolean. Uh, the way that the algorithm works is that you start with an initially empty set of counterexamples, right? So there is no sample, which means that any term that you provide is going to be correctly classifying the sample since it's empty. Say that you term a term of size zero, which one can be X, for example, this term will fail because X does not correctly satisfy all the constraints here. And then you're going to get a refinement lemma, which is a counterexample for the candidate solution that you tried. Say that you get this counterexample here. Now, what I have to do is to find a term assignment in the another predicate list that correctly classifies this sample, which means that I am assigning terms to each one of the input, the input points that I have so that the constraints are satisfied. Um, there is no assignment in which I have a single term that satisfies this. So I need at least more than one term. If you are remembering the fairness criteria, one of the components is the number of different terms I'm using in my term assignment. Because I have here that one point must be two, for example, another must be one. So uh, it's impossible to solve this with a single term. Well, actually that's not true because uh, it could be a function, it could work. But uh, <laughs> we have more than these two constraints and believe me, it is true that there is not a single term that satisfies simultaneously all these constraints. Since there is not, then we have to increase our search space bound and we increase the maximum size because we're increasing the number of terms. And by now having two different terms, because if you remember the size is the log of the number of terms, number of terms is now two, size is one, number of predicates is also one. And now we can produce as an assignment and a predicate order predicate list that works in the refinement lemmas and the separation lemmas. There are no separation lemmas yet. It will, there will be one soon. Uh, and now I have to check whether this correctly classifies the sample and what would it be to correctly classify the sample? To correctly classify the sample would be for the assignment to work in all the refinement lemmas in my tree. Since the only predicate that I have is true, it's not separating points. So I have only one leaf in the tree, which is with all the points together, which means that I need to find a single term that works in all the points, but this is impossible. And the reason for this is explaining this lemma. So this lemma says that if you have only one predicate and this predicate is true, then it must be the case that these two points must be equal because these are two points that you have in the same leaf that are different. So now, if you want to provide another candidate, you need to satisfy not only the refinement lemmas, but also the separation lemmas. So what you're trying to do, remember, is to produce a term assignment and an order predicate list that works in all the lemmas, and then you have to check whether it correctly classifies the sample. So it works simultaneously in all the points. 
And now, how do we do this? So the classification checker is run incrementally in the sense that you, you add simultaneously to your tree, the tree represented by this other predicate list, the points, and you check if in the same leaf, you have points that have different term assignments and that you cannot separate with a given predicate, if you could add a new predicate. So let's go to the example. Then we have here the first point, F11. So it's the, it's the single point in the leaf, so there is no issue. I add this new point, F10, since they have the same value in the term assignment, they can be in the same leaf, there is no problem. Then I add the new point. It again can be in the same leaf since it has the same term assignment. But now when I add the last point that I have, I cannot add it because it has a different term assignment. I cannot have it in the same in the same leaf, so I need to separate them. And now what I try to do is to use my order predicate list to resolve the conflict. So you are really building the tree incrementally. In this case, I had only one leaf now. Now I have added one attribute, the first predicate that I have here, and this attribute will separate the points in a given way. It's just by evaluating the predicate. And we can see that we have these two leaves now, and all the points in one leaf have the same term assignment, and this works for both leaves, which means that the sample is correctly classified. If it were not, then we would generate a separation lemma explaining why it was not correctly classified, and we would try again to come up with a term assignment in an order predicate list. Since these guys correctly classified, they can try this candidate solution. However, this candidate solution Note that it is not the candidate solution that solves this problem. Uh, this is the candidate solution that solves this problem if you run it in the specification. And this is how the algorithm works. So you are trying to build this candidate solution. And as long as you fail, you're going to generate lemmas and you are going to continue. And given the way that the, the, the search works, you are guaranteed to find a solution if one exists within the bound limit. And you are always increasing the limit as you need it. Okay. Right, so the other version of the algorithm is one that does one thing different, which is not in, in the previous algorithm, I was generating the order predicate list by solving the separation lemmas, but a different way of solving this problem is by having the SMT solver generating the term assignment, which means to find a an assignment for the points that works in the refinement lemmas, which are the counterexamples for the specification failing a candidate, and a predicate enumerator that just generates predicates, and then you can use regular decision tree learning to try to solve this problem. So this, this is in a sense, uh, it's, it's, more, it's a more mundane approach for solving this problem, but it can work very well. And since, however, you're using heuristic decision tree learning here, I'm not going to go into details, but you lose completeness and minimality guarantees, but you, you can solve the problem in some cases when you cannot in the other. So to provide some experimental results, we have implemented this in CVC4, in CVC4 SI, as we call the extension of the SMT solver CVC4 that can solve synthesis problems. We evaluated it against uh, other Cygus solvers, systems that solve the, the Cygus problem using benchmarks for the invariant synthesis category of the Cygus competition of 2018. And we also evaluated it against a model checker, kind two, because, so we evaluated it in invariant synthesis problems because as I mentioned before, invariant synthesis is a case in which you have non-pointwise specifications. And we did not at the time have other benchmarks available to us in which we had other non-pointwise specifications to test this. <clears throat> uh, and testing against kind two, one thing, as one reviewer put it when we submitted this work for peer review to FNCAD, was that it was good to inject some real-world realism here. Because the, the way that things are is that in Cygus, you are solving the synthesis problem for invariants in generally a less efficient way than it solved the model checkers because in model checkers, they're specialized to the theory of linear integer arithmetic, while in Cygus, it's more general. But as, as I'm going to show quickly, like we have good results also in comparison with kind two. 
So the, the comparison is done against a baseline, which is using enumerative CGs, also as implemented in CVC4. And then we have the two flavors of the algorithm I showed, the one in which the SMT solver is doing all the classification and the one in which are combining the classification by the SMT solver together with the, the, the heuristic decision tree learning. And we also compared against loop InvGen, which is a Saiga solver specializing in variant synthesis. That was the winner of the Saiga Scamp 2018. We used half an hour, eight gigabytes of RAM. And just to provide a, a summary of the results, then as we can see here, this is the, the baselines, right? So loop InvGen and CVC4 with CGs. And they behave not very dissimilarly, CVC4 better in terms of uh, how many problems it solves, but loop infgen can solve more problems faster, but there are some problems it cannot solve, right? And the version of CVC4 that uses the, the complete algorithm, it behaves similarly to loop infgen, but it has also issues that there are some problems that it cannot solve. And the, and the version that combines the SMT solving for doing the synthesis together with the heuristic decision tree learning, that behaves better. It solves more problems uniquely. Yeah, you're right. It solves more problems uniquely, and but less problems overall than CGs. But the, the, the very important takeaway here is that these techniques add a lot of orthogonality. So if we look at a virtual portfolio of CVC4 with CGs before, it could solve 340 problems in the universe of uh, 550 problems, I believe. It's, it's what the number I showed before. And then together, it greatly increases the number of problems that you can solve. And this is one of the reasons, so I'm going to skip this. This is one of the reasons that we won the, the invariant synthesis track in the Saigas competition in 2019 because of these new techniques that we added to how we can do invariant synthesis given the new way that we can try non-pointwise specifications. Uh, when we compared against kind two, I mean, kind two is much better. So it can solve the benchmarks that we consider this 480, it can solve all of them in less than two minutes. But CVC4, if we combine all of the techniques and you only consider K induction, which is a, a, <laughs> a shady comparison that you are taking, not the best technique that kind two employs, but this used to be the state of the art model checking, it's still very used there are more problems that can be solved with CVC4 using this much more general technique. So these are very encouraging results. We're very happy with them. All right. <clears throat> so just to conclude, we have proposed this new enumerative function synthesis framework for doing divide and conquer. The main selling point is the fact that we are no longer dependent on pointwise specifications. So we can employ this more scalable technique for techniques such as invariant synthesis, for example. It is powered by, powered by SMT which allows us to have nice guarantees for completeness, minimality, and so on. It's implemented, and we have experimentally evaluated it. So thank you. Muito obrigado, Raniel. Uh, bom, passamos agora para a fase de interação. Quem tiver alguma pergunta, eu peço que se manifeste primeiramente pelo chat para a gente poder fazer uma fila. Se alguém não quiser falar, lembrando que isso está sendo gravado e vai ser disponibilizado no YouTube, quem não quiser falar pode digitar pergunta, ou se quiser fazer anonimamente pode enviá-la para contato.sbl.org.br e eu repasso a pergunta. Então, se alguém tiver alguma pergunta ou comentário, por favor, se manifeste. Elaine, pode falar. Ah, oi, oi, Raniel, oi, Bruno. Oi, Elaine. Tudo bem? É, então, desculpa, eu ia digitar, mas eu sou realmente muito ruim para digitar, então é melhor perguntar. É, eu achei muito legal essa apresentação, é, claro, eu não entendi tudo porque não sou da área, mas assim, deu para pelo menos os primeiros exemplos... É, entender alguma coisa, entender o método de divide and conquer, etc. É, o que, que vocês estão... Esse foi um trabalho que você fez com o Chesley, não foi? Enquanto você estava nos Estados Unidos. Isso. E você... Foi, foi um trabalho que vocês apresentaram no Cave aqui, o ano passado? 
Não, esse foi apresentado no FMK em San José, ano passado. No Cade eu estava apresentando ah. um que era estender para a ordem de lógica superior, só o estender ah, de SMT. Desculpa, desculpa, tá, tá, tá. Então, a minha pergunta é exatamente o que, que vocês estão pensando de fazer de future work com relação a esse trabalho em particular seu? Ah, é, eu ainda estou compartilhando a minha tela? Tá, Não. sim. Bom, sim, mais ou menos. <risos> Aparece isso aí? Agora tá. Tá. É, o, é que eu tenho um slide aqui. Tem um slide de, de future work que existem, existem alguns problemas. É, um dos problemas é o fato de que pra, quando a gente aplica é, decision tree learning, ele é muito baseado no conjunto de pontos que você tem no momento. Porque o que a gente precisa é ter pontos que deveriam ser separados ou não, que deveriam ser classificados de, diferentemente ou não. Só que se quanto mais diferentes são as entradas dos pontos, mais difícil é separá-los, porque você tem que gerar um predicado que separe esses pontos. Então, tem algumas coisas que, que a gente vai fazer no futuro, estamos fazendo, que é tentar diminuir a diferença entre os pontos. Porque os pontos são gerados no momento em que você produz um candidato e esse candidato falha. Então, você tem um, uma testemunha de por que o candidato falhou. Só que essa testemunha, ela não necessariamente tem a obrigação de ser a testemunha mínima, por assim dizer. No sentido de que eu tenho cinco variáveis, por exemplo, nesse problema aqui eu tenho sete variáveis para a minha função, sete parâmetros, e três são diferentes. Mas, por exemplo, eu poderia minimizar, nesse, nesse caso aqui de baixo, em que eu só tenho um dos componentes da função sendo diferente. Isso é uma forma de gerar melhores exemplos. Então, é mais fácil separar esses pontos, produzir uma, uma árvore de decisão que separa esses pontos do que separar essa. Esse é um ponto. Outro ponto é melhorar como a gente gera os term assignments, em vez de usar enumeração, tentar utilizar mais raciocínio da teoria para poder gerar o, o term assignment. E esses são os dois pontos principais, na verdade, que são duas formas diferentes de aumentar a escalabilidade do método. Tá já. Obrigada. Não. Obrigado a você pelo pergunta. Mário? Olá, Raniel. Prazer. Tudo bem? Olá, Gostei prazer. Obrigado. Obrigado. Boa. É, mais uma curiosidade, eu vi que a linguagem que você usa, a linguagem dos termos, é, não tem nada como recursão ou interação, um while, um repeat. Ou, ou foi... Isso é... Você podia comentar um pouco qual a dificuldade, por que que... Tá, é... Existe, na verdade, isso é uma das coisas que a gente está trabalhando no momento. De fato, isso vai depender da gramática, né? Você pode definir uma gramática que tenha, é, que defina funções recursivas, por exemplo, ou uma linguagem que defina é, um laço e assim vai. Então, se você precisa gerar programas mais com o que a gente está acostumado, programas imperativos em que você tem um laço, em que você tem recursão e assim vai. É... Isso não é, não é nenhuma restrição, em princípio, de como você pode escrever. Você sempre pode escrever uma gramática que lhe permita ter esse tipo de, de programa, que resolva o seu problema. Agora, o que se torna necessário é que o, o sistema que está checando as soluções seja capaz de lidar com o que você escreveu. Porque, por exemplo, as funções que, que eu estava escrevendo, elas eram funções sobre... É, sobre a aritmética linear, por exemplo. Então, eu sou capaz de checar que um determinado candidato que diz que x mais y deve ser 5, por exemplo, que isso, de fato, é o caso ou não. Se eu escrever um candidato que diz que enquanto x menor do que 5 executa um conjunto de instruções, eu tenho que ser capaz de raciocinar sobre isso. Então, eu tenho que ser capaz de entender a semântica do candidato que eu produzi. E o que você pode fazer, então, é escrever axiomas que definem a semântica do, da linguagem em que você está gerando os programas candidatos. E o CVC4, que é esse sistema com que eu trabalho, ele também é capaz de entender tanto quantificadores gerais como quantificadores que representam funções recursivas. Então, a gente pode escrever uma especificação da semântica da linguagem, 
se você quer escrever uma linguagem com laços, por exemplo. E aí a gente escreve essa especificação e junto com o problema de síntese, a gente passa a especificação dessa linguagem. Então, é basicamente, eu estou definindo a minha própria teoria dos programas que eu estou gerando e aí eu preciso fazer o sistema entender essa teoria. Como o sistema consegue entender quantificadores arbitrários, eu posso qualificar qualquer teoria. É uma questão apenas de fazer isso eficientemente. Obrigado. Rani, essas implementações estão disponíveis no GitHub ou algo similar? Então, então sim. O, o CVC4, ele, ele tem, uma, tem, uma, tem um repositório no GitHub. É, todas essas técnicas que eu falei, elas são implementadas no... É, em master, então elas estão disponíveis diretamente e você pode também baixar binários já compilados ou você pode compilar você mesmo mas está tá tudo disponível assim é tudo código aberto mais alguma pergunta? bom, mais uma vez eu queria agradecer o Raniel Agradecer a presença de todos. Uh, próxima semana, dia 7 de maio, teremos a palestra do professor Wagner Sanz. Coincidentemente, vai o dia da Marcha Virtual pela Ciência, que está sendo organizado pela Sociedade Brasileira para o Progresso da Ciência, acaba se tornando um pouco parte dessa manifestação. Então, muito obrigado, Bruno, pelo convite. Muito obrigado a todo mundo pela atenção.